come, we ask all of you and none of me or us. We ask that you clear every spirit out of the way that would interfere with receiving your word as it comes forth, Father God. Mm -hmm. Let us be instruments, me, the giver and, the, and receiver, and let us all plug into what you have for us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. This morning, I'm going to start a series with you that's going to cover a lot of information, and I'm not going to try to give it all to you at once, but I think it's very critical in this time. And this series is going to be called Covenant, Consistency, and Commitment. Uh -uh. Covenant, Consistency, and Commitment. Uh -uh. And the covenant part is so important because today, covenant has lost its meaning for the church and for most of God's people. Marriage is a covenant relationship between a man and a woman ordained by God. And if God has set the terms and conditions for that covenant relationship, then how can Bob and Steve and Alice and Louise get together and say they married? Mm -hmm. They are not married because they are not in covenant. Mm -hmm. Because God has some conditions for what constitutes a covenant. And I'm going to give you that covenant foundation because there are 15 major covenants throughout the Bible. And God is a reason that he's made covenant after covenant. And he's consistent in terms of the covenants that he's made and keeping his word. Because number says that he's not man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. Mm -hmm. And what he has said he will do, he will and he does do. Amen. So we're talking about covenant relationships this morning. And before I mention the elements of the covenant relationship, I want you to understand that man has a substitute that he calls a contract. And a contract is different than a covenant. Now a contract has three elements to it. The elements to a contract are offer, acceptance, and mutual consideration. Offer, acceptance, and mutual consideration. When you take your car to the shop, you enter into a contract. They offer to fix it. You accept the offer. The mutual consideration is a price that you agree to pay for the service rendered. Mm -hmm. Offer acceptance. A contract has an expiration date. That contract expires when your car is fixed and you pay for it. And it doesn't go any further than that. Mm -hmm. So hence we understand why marriage is not a contract. Because if it were a contract, it would have an expiration date on it other than the one that God puts on it. Right. Now, a covenant, by contrast, does not have an expiration date on it. A covenant is till death do the party's part. Mm -hmm. And a covenant is more, even more serious than a contract. Because in a covenant relationship, the parties are not necessarily equal. In a contract, the parties got to be equal. And you know, it's a funny thing about contracts, especially with some black people who do services with folks. They like to get you involved in a work relationship, and then they want to increase the price at the end of the time. <laughs> you came over to cut my grass. I thought it was going to be $20. <laughs> now that it's finished, you come to the door and say, I need 35 you can't do that. You cannot change the price of a contract after the fact. Mm -hmm. The contract price has to be agreed to in the beginning in order for the contract to work. Now, there are different kinds of contracts. The one kind is called a contract with a condition precedent. And a contract with a condition precedent requires that certain things be done in advance in order for the contract to work. Mm -hmm. So if you take your car to a garage to be repaired, one of the conditions is that the garage has got to have some tools. It's got to have somebody there that can fix it. You're just not going to drive it up to an automated window, push the button and get a piece of paper out and, 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 and come back for your car later thinking something's going to be done. <laughs> there are also contracts that call for specific performance. And so if you hire someone to make a wedding cake for you, and the time comes for the wedding, and the cake's not there, that's a breach of contract. Mm -hmm. Now, 
There are other little contracts, and I'm not making a long contract thing, but I'm doing this for a reason. Pledges are binding contracts. Mm -hmm. A person pledges to marry another person. A ring is given as a, as a token gesture that go with it, but the ring was not required. Follow me? Mm -hmm. And so many times when a wedding is, uh, engagement is broken off, people start suing over the ring because the ring is worth so much money, somebody <laughs> wants the ring back. And she said, the ring is mine. So this is this is my my remedy for my pain and suffering. Well, you put me through all this, so I'm gonna hold on to this this rock that you gave, and the rock's gonna make me feel better. Okay, of course, gonna let me keep the rock. Okay, you can't call into uh, KBPS and do a little fundraiser and make a pledge of a hundred thousand dollars. It's fraud if you ain't got it. It's breach of contract if you have it and you don't put it up. So man's covered all kinds of things, but God came along and made all of this stuff simple. God understood that man couldn't be equal to him in terms of entering into an agreement. And so, when we get into the 15th chapter of Genesis, we get a real education in terms of what God says because he's gone and talked to Abraham. And having talked to Abraham, he's decided that he's gonna enter into this covenant agreement with Abraham. And when he goes into this agreement, it sets the tone for a lot of things that are going to come later on. Now, in Genesis, the 15th chapter, uh, starting at the 7th verse, we have a reference here where it says, and this is God, and he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees. Give thee this land to inherit it. Now, Ur is an actual place in Iraq. So Abraham was Iraqi. Mm. Not Iranian, but he was Iraqi. And he came, the people of Iraq were called the Chaldeans. So we have Chaldeans here in San Diego today that own all these markets, mm -hmm. and they come from Iraq, and they come from the home of Abraham. Mm -hmm. And many of them are Christians, and a number of them are Muslims. Mm -hmm. And so there are reasons in covenant for why we have the differences between them, okay? So God goes on to say in the 8th verse, and he said, Lord God, uh, Abraham is saying, where I shall I know that I shall inherit it? And God said to him, and he said to him, take me a heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Some interesting is taking place here, isn't it? He got three items, and each of the three items are three years old. Mm -hmm. The number three, mm -hmm. again, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. we see the, the three. So God has given Abraham some, some directions, okay? And it says that he took unto him all these and divided them in the midst and laid each piece one against another, but the birds did, he, he did not divide. Okay, now, let's talk about the elements of a covenant. A covenant often took place prior to biblical times when there were people who had a need of each other. Mm -hmm. Some people were hunter-gatherers, all right, and some were farmers. And so what happened to the farmers is that oftentimes with the farmers, there were people who were thieves or warlike that would come. How many of you re remember seeing the Magnificent Seven? Yeah. Okay, I like to use movies to make a point. <laughs> so the Magnificent Seven involved these people in this village that were all farmers, right? Mm -hmm. And at crop time, harvest time, all these bandits would come and take everything they had from them. Mm -hmm. And then they would be left poor and they'd wait and come back and rob them the next year. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what happens is the, the, the hunters, they spent their time hunting for meat. The farmers raised the crops. So the hunters and the gatherers got together and said, okay, let's make this work. You hunters will supply us with some meat, and we will supply you with corn and stuff, and then that way we work together. So then we got two people coming together, agreeing on something, but they're not equal because what the... 
agricultural person, y'all gonna need to get a little control here, okay? Because it's distracting me in terms of keeping up with what I'm doing. I don't mean to be unkind, but that's a little too much. The, the hunters will bring in an abundance of stuff. The farmers are sharing what they have. Mm -hmm. Now here are the elements to the covenant. Mm -hmm. The covenant says that people are going to come together. Mm -hmm. There's going to be an oath made between them. And one is going to pledge that I'm going to defend you with my life and whatever I have. And you're going to do the same thing. You see already the difference between the contract? Mm -hmm. The contract just has some little things on the table. But now when we get into the covenant, we put life there. I'm going to defend you to the death. So you people who are farmers, you don't worry about these people coming to attack you anymore. If they come back for you, I will bring everybody I got to stop them from bothering you. Mm -hmm. Because we are in covenant agreement. See how that works? Mm -hmm. Now, in order for the covenant there, there's an oath there. Let me show you how the American Indians understood this, right? Because what did the Indians do? Found a white guy that seemed like he was like them. First thing they did is cut their hands and let blood mingle. And they became what? Blood brothers. Mm -hmm. Blood is a key element to a covenant. There has to be some blood because the word says that life is in the blood. Mm -hmm. Okay? And so if the covenant commitment is for life, and life is in the blood, so the blood is important to the covenant. See how it's working? So now we have a oath and we're going to have some blood. What we see God did here, he had Abraham bring all three of these elements and cut them in half. Now what happened was, and it didn't happen with God, when the animals were cut in half and the blood was there, the people who entered into the covenant would walk between the halves. Okay? And that was their commitment, that they walked between the halves that they had cut. Because each half represented them, and that was a sacrifice. That's the blood sacrifice. Now, what God says is, he put Abraham to sleep. And then God took an oath himself. He says, since I can't swear by anybody else, I'm going to swear by myself. That's bad. <laughs> okay? Because Abraham certainly is not in no equal bargaining position with God. Mm -mm. Right. So God said, I'm going to swear by myself that I'm going to do all this for you and for your descendants. Mm -hmm. This is my word, and my word won't change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Abraham is being blessed right now in terms of this thing. So the other piece that occurs with it is we got the oath, we got the blood being shed. In God's case, the animals were cut in half. In man's case, many times, they cut an animal in half. Or they did like the Indians, they mingled blood. But there was still a blood contribution to this, this thing called this covenant. This unconditional agreement which was not going to be broken. You see how that is? No way is it going to be broken. This is God's. You see how sacred this thing is with God? This covenant is important to God. And so one of the examples that I like to point out that God made in the covenant when Noah landed on Mount Arafat after the flood and God came down, Noah made a sacrifice and God made a statement to Noah. You'll see it in Genesis. He says, this covenant I make with you, he says from now on there will be seed time and harvest night and day winter and fall, never again will there be a destruction by flood and the rainbow is my symbol of the promise that I'm making to you in terms of this commitment. Mm -hmm. There again we see God doing this covenant thing on a big scale. You know, Pastor, we spend a lot of time with this covenant because this thing is important. Because Jesus himself is the 16th part to the covenant. Mm -hmm. Because remember, I, when we have communion, I point out to you that what Jesus says is that this day I come to make a new covenant. Mm -hmm. The covenant that he makes at the Passover is foretold in Jeremiah 31. When God says, I'm going to make another covenant with you, and this one I'm not going to write in stone, but I'm going to write on the hearts of men. 
because stone you can't keep up with. <laughs> so if I put it in your heart, you're going to think about it and you're going to remember it. Amen. It's going to be there richly. Amen. Now, another piece to the covenant. God entered into a covenant with Abraham. He promised him a son. He also entered into a covenant with Sarah. And he entered into a covenant with Hagar. These are part of the 15 covenants that he did. The covenant with Sarah was, I'm changing your name from Sarah to Sarah. I'm sorry, from Sarah to Sarah. At first her name was spelled S-A-R-I. Now it's being spelled S-A-R-A-H as we spell it. He changed Abraham's name from Abram to Abraham. Because why did he do that? Because he says, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. Your seed is be more innumerable than the stars and the sand on the beach. And the way I'm going to do this is, I'm going to start you confessing it, even though at 100 years old, you can't see how it can happen. Mm -hmm. So the name Abraham means father of many nations. So every time somebody calls you Abraham, they're calling you the father of many nations. And what does the word say? The word says, speak those things that be not as though they were. Mm -hmm. And so it's being spoken into existence. You see how it's working? Yes. God's got a covenant principle working, and we are contributing to the manifestation of the covenant by bringing life to what has been said. Because the word says the power of life and death is in the tongue. They that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. And so here comes the strength with it. So now Sarah is going to be the mother of many nations. Mm. Hagar, the mother of Ishmael, out there in the desert ready to kill herself. God comes to her. The Hagaric covenant is referred to. And he enters into an agreement with her. He tells her, you go on back there and be submissive to this woman. Don't worry about her. I'm going to take your son. And your son is going to be a prince. He's going to be over 12 princes because mm. they had 12 sons from Ishmael as there were 12 that came from Jacob. And God is still honoring the covenant with Abraham because in the covenant he said, your seed shall be blessed. So Ishmael is a seed. Mm -hmm. Ishmael is considered the seed of the flesh. Isaac is considered the seed of the promise because God foretold Isaac. He didn't foretell Ishmael. And he foretold Isaac 25 years before he came. And then when he did come, he came at a time that was supposed to be impossible. He's 100 years old. She's old. And uh, no Viagra on the scene. Ain't no way it's going to happen. Okay? No artificial insemination. None of everything's dried up and gone south. And here comes God bringing it back. Amen. That's why when he came in the body with the two angels and he stopped to talk to Abraham, and told Sarah she was going to get pregnant, she was laughing. She was outside the tent. She was laughing like, yeah, that's really funny. I'm 100 years old. Uh, yeah, he said this time next year. This time he's specific, right? By this time next year, it happens. Hmm. Now, covenant. When God gave the covenant, he gave some predictions with the covenant. He didn't just say, I'm going to multiply you. Just sit, sit back and wait for it and see what happens. He didn't say that. He says, your seed's going to be blessed. He says they're going to go into slavery for 400 years. You hear the scripture. They're going to come out after 400 years. And they're going to come out with substance. They're going to come out blessed. And they're going to come out blessed. And then I'm going to punish the people who kept them for 400 years. He, he's laying out the whole plan to them. Mm -hmm. He's being very specific. This is covenant. Mm -hmm. God says, I'm here for life. My life, beyond your life, I'm going to be here with the life of your descendants because this is a life covenant. We don't really get another insightful manifestation of how much life he put to the covenant until we get way down the road to the Davidic covenant. And when he enters into the covenant with David, he says that your descendant will be on the throne forever. That's a reference to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Because anybody else living forever. Mm -mm. But God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So he's, he's set that thing up for it to come that way. Yeah. I'm giving you pieces about covenant, but I got to do this covenant piece again because we're missing it today. We all caught up with uh, uh, gay rights and the whole scenario going on. And I like that when I'm talking covenant, reminds you again. It's one thing for the law to say, we're going to let you have a legal partnership 
because two people live together and one something happens to one and they're not related and the present system won't let that roommate or that partner come to the hospital or, or put you on the insurance or whatever. So we, we corrected all that. But it's another thing when you're going to try to take this whole phony relationship now <laughs> and then you're going to try to make it holy. Yeah, that's going too far. Mm -hmm. Now I'm say why it can't be holy. Circumcision is what was identified that God required of Abraham. I can't imagine him circumcising himself, but I have he got it done, he got it done, he stayed consistent with what was promised. Now, why did God require the circumcision? God required the circumcision because the circumcision represented Abraham's blood contribution to the covenant that he entered into with God. Because the covenant has got an oath and the covenant has got blood. Well, yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so I've shared that part before. And I've shared with you that when a man and a woman get married and the hymen is broken, that the breaking of the hymen as the two come together to be one, according to the scripture, represents her blood contribution to the covenant of their generation. Mm -hmm. Because each generation had to make, renew the covenant. You see, the covenant wasn't just one time and then it stopped. Each generation is renewing it. That's why, under the Mosaic law, the child had to, the male child had to be circumcised on the eighth day. Jesus was taken to the temple on the eighth day and circumcised according to the law. Moses almost got wiped out because he was so busy he didn't circumcise his sons and Zipporah, his wife, jumped up and got it done because God was getting ready to move on him. Uh -oh. As tight as they were, God was saying, you didn't do what I said right. and I'm serious about what I said. Mm -hmm. So he got it done. So now if God is requiring these blood contributions on a consistent basis, in Genesis he says, for this cause shall a man leave his mother and father and join to his wife and the two become one. Mm -hmm. So now we understand that if the two are becoming one, now their blood contribution, they have established their covenant. That's why when I give you Galatians 3.15 and we're over in the New Testament, I'm sharing with you, what does it say? Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Because mm -hmm. if you broke the covenant, you were cursed. So Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law that the blessings of Abraham may come upon who? The Gentiles through Christ Jesus. And we are the Gentiles because we were not born Jews. Mm -hmm. But because we have been grafted in by the sacrifice of Christ, the blood sacrifice, now we have adoptive status. And 329 says that we are now children of the promise. See how that works? So you got to know who you are if you're going to benefit in terms of your rights. If you don't know who you are, you can't benefit. Right. And so many of us have not been taught who we are. Mm -hmm. We see the Bible as a document with some old history in it. And we see the Jews and we have people say, well, you ain't a Jew. You ain't an Israelite. So we're... Well, first of all, the Jew and the Israelite are the same thing. we got to remember that God changed Jacob's name to Israel when he had the wrestling match with the angel. And that Jacob, now Israel, when the family came and Joseph identified his family and let them know who he was, he invited them to Egypt and there were 70 people. That means that his other 11 brothers and their families and Israel, that 70 of them went into Egypt and 6 million of them came out mm. 400 years later. Mm. So they were called Israelites because they were the children of Israel. You gotta know who you are. Yeah. And so now we don't have to be worried about that because the coverage that we have in the scripture in Galatians that we've been redeemed and we are now blood. Well why do we have to be redeemed? In the Old Testament sin could be atoned for but it was not forgiven or removed. Okay? So that's why we had atonement, Yom Kippur, atonement, holy day. And it was atoned for by an animal being killed and the blood of the animal being sacrificed. And I've often told you that that was like putting a carpet. The sin is the mud is the floor and the blood is the carpet that now allows God to walk across the sin for the time being to have fellowship with man 
Because without the carpet being there, there can't be no fellowship because God can't deal with sin. Right. He won't touch sin. Mm -hmm. And so why does the blood, because God said earlier that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. Mm -hmm. So where did it start? With Adam and Eve, when they sinned, and God made the skin suits for them, the outfits out of the animal, he didn't just go to Neiman Marcus and Macy's and grab some clothes for them. He had to kill a couple of animals to take those skins to give to them. That was the blood sacrifice. Hebrews talks about the blood sacrifice, that the sacrifice of goats in them will not do. But now, with Jesus coming along, God is saying, I've got a lamb that's going to make a sacrifice once and for all. This plan was so far even before covenant that Revelations tells us that Christ was slain from before the foundation of the world, mm -hmm. which meant it took place in the spirit realm mm -hmm. before it ever manifests in the natural. Mm -hmm. We know that when Abraham took Isaac up to the mountain to sacrifice him because God said, take your son, your only son, bring him up and sacrifice him to me, mm. Abraham could have said, I mean, this is crazy. <laughs> I waited 100 years to get this kid. He ain't about 12 years old. And you want him? What's with this? But he said, okay, because he's operating. Hebrews 12 tells us in terms uh -huh. of faith. Mm -hmm. Abraham is saying, as we are supposed to be thinking, mm -hmm. if God gave him to me and God tells me to kill him, God can raise him up again. Right. So I'm going to do what God said. Amen. And it says the word, it, counted, it was counted to him. Because, again, what is this man doing? He's honoring covenant. And when he's honoring covenant, he's being blessed. And why is he being blessed honoring covenant? Because I keep giving you all the time, Isaiah 119, if you be willing and obedient, you shall eat of the good of the land, you shall prosper. Yeah. So you see covenant. Mm -hmm. And it's so important that we deal with covenant because today when we look at the New Testament, we are so caught up under grace that we're missing the fact that covenant hasn't been erased or canceled. Covenant is still in play. If covenant wasn't in play, revelations would not be promising the 144,000 that are going to be saved in Israel after the, 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 the great war takes place. Mm -hmm. Well, how is God going to save 144,000 of them? They don't even believe in Jesus. They're going to be saved because of the promise of Abraham. Abraham's promise, they got 12 tribes. He's going to save 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. That's 144,000 people going to be saved. Because mm -hmm. that's enough. The remnant is enough to keep the promise that he made to mm -hmm. Abraham. Mm -hmm. That don't even have nothing to do with us. Let's talk about them. Because we already believe it, so we get, we get grafted in. Amen. But they aren't. Hallelujah. So, you know, Christians are running around talking about going to Israel and talking about Jesus. Unless you're a Messianic Jew, people over there... All they care about is whether they come over here, they tourists, they can spend some money. We can let them go to Bethlehem and <laughs> let them get baptized in the Jordan, take a couple of bus trips and everything, mm -hmm. and they bring the money. But we don't, we don't believe that. Because mm. the Jews didn't work trying to stop that whole movement here, which is another story. So here we have this covenant relationship that requires an oath. It requires blood. It requires a lifetime commitment. And it was usually, when done between two people, it was usually manifest with a meal that they shared. Mm. Hence, I had the Tamar read the scriptures about Laban. Laban, we know, was the one that Jacob went to after he cheated his brother out of his blessing. And Isaac died and Jacob had to flee for his life. His mother was in on a conspiracy. Rebecca helped make it happen. And so Jacob went over there, and we know that Jacob's name means trickster, okay? Yeah. And so the trickster got tricked because hmm. he went to Laban, and he fell in love with Rachel, and he worked seven years, and on red night, they switched women on him. <laughs> then he had to work seven more, oh, no. and then he finally got him. But by, that time he had, by the time it's all over, he's got four wives, in effect, and 12 sons. Oh, no. Okay, oh, so now the 12 has been fulfilled on... The Abraham on the Isaac side, but it was already fulfilled on the Ishmael side. You see how that works? So God kept this going. But what Laban says to them is, he's saying, if you break this covenant, these are things that will happen. 
So God is saying repeatedly in the scriptures, telling people what's going to happen if they don't follow him. Mm -hmm. Deuteronomy 28 is our favorite example of that. Because in Deuteronomy 28, God says, choose ye this day what you're going to do and who you're going to serve. He says, if you follow and obey me, this is what's going to happen to you. You're going to be blessed going, coming, what you put your hands to, your children, everything. Just bless, bless, bless. But he says, starting in verse 14, if you don't, this is what's going to happen. He tells you you're going to have hemorrhoids. You're going to have hemorrhoids. That's, that's uncomfortable. That's pretty specific. You're going to have hemorrhoids. You're going to have all kinds of problems. Mm -hmm. you ain't gonna, you're going to be cursed coming in, cursed going out. Oh, we, don't we see that today? I sure don't want to go to work today. I don't want to be around them people. You get off of work, I don't want to go home. All the people in the house raising hell. And, <laughs> and, uh, well, you're cursed going out, coming in, mm -hmm. and, and you it's fulfilling the curse. I'm stretching the dollar, but I don't have enough. Uh, I can't make the ends meet. Because they're ends. They're not a circle. They're not supposed to meet. So this is the curse that's manifesting, the shortage, the lack. And then he says over in the prophets, he says, I will blow on your pockets. Mm. I will put holes in your pockets. I will blow on your money. You won't have enough. Then he gets real graphic. He says, not only you be poor. He said, somebody else going to grind over your wife. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's getting real personal, ain't it? If it ain't for the money, that ought to be enough to make you look up and say, what? <laughs> yeah, he's, he's going right after everything. That the curse is just going to be there. Because this is breaking covenant. Okay? So when we understand that God set these conditions, ain't no such thing as no gay marriage. Mm -mm. It's a gay farce. I always say, if I need currency from this wall over there, I can't take two plugs and rub sockets and rub them together. <laughs> And rub, rub something up, up against the wall. It's just like, what's it? I got to make a connection with the wall to get the juice out. Yeah. Okay. And, and the covenant is important in terms of man and woman because in Genesis, God made this statement. He said, be fruitful and multiply. Right. I've told you before, not only did he say be fruitful and multiply, but he said these key words too. He said, replenish the earth. Mm hmm. Okay, and so we already dealt with what was here before, and then we're putting back what was here before. He's bringing back. So how are you going to be fruitful and multiply? You got two of a kind. You get, I mean, when he took them into the ark, he took male and female. Mm -hmm. It says he created them male and female, created he them. Mm -hmm. So he, he, he made what was necessary to make it work. And here we come with all these substitutes, because Satan is a spirit. He's real. He's a counterfeiter. He is an imitator. Mm -hmm. He's always trying to do what God does. If you don't believe counterfeit works, look at that plant over there under the picture. Doesn't that plant look real? <laughs> that plant looks so real. You look around at all these plants, they look so real. And, and then when you go into the store, uh, a restaurant, you know, you see, they bring out the food cart and you see the desserts on there. Yeah. And you think that's the real stuff. That's that, that's that plastic stuff they'd have made because the real stuff would go bad. But they have made the counterfeit, and it looks so real. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so Satan is getting with the counterfeits. Mm -hmm. Because if he can get you to grab the counterfeit, you will forsake the promise. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to grab the counterfeit. That's how no. Abraham and Sarah got in trouble. They got tired of waiting. They thought God had forgot. So stick Hagar in there and see what we can do. <laughs> and now we got problems. Because right. Hagar ain't yeah. don't want to hear nothing from Sarah. Because I'm fruitful and you barren. And you might be in charge, but look at me. Yeah, look what I got. So we got all of that going on. So this covenant peace is so important. Jesus comes. Look at what happens with Abraham when he takes Isaac up to sacrifice him. You go back and read the 12th chapter of Hebrews, the hall of faith, I call it. How people believed God for what he said and how they were blessed. Mm -hmm. And most of what they were believing him for was a result of covenant promises that God had made to them. Mm -hmm. And when God, Abraham was up there and he took the boy up and, and, and Isaac said, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham says, God will provide. Amen. And when he gets ready to kill the kid, what? God gives, stops him and gives him a ram. The ram people, not a lamb. The reason he gives him the ram is because God's holding the lamb. Jesus is the lamb. Mm -hmm. And God's holding the lamb, so he gives him a ram to sacrifice. And the place where he is sacrificed, the hill there that he went up to sacrifice on, that 
hundreds of years later, is called the place of the skull, mm. Golgotha. And the reason it's called the place of the skull is because that is where David buried the head of Goliath that he had cut off. And it became the known as the place of the skull. And it ends up being when Jesus is crucified there, then God is making his gift in the same place that he had asked man to give. So that's why we have this song that said, you can't be God giving. The more he gives, you give, the more he gives back to you. Mm -hmm. So he, because you are willing to sacrifice your son, I'm going to give my son. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So how are we supposed to believe all of this, Pastor? Well, we're supposed to believe all of this because 2 Timothy 3.16 says, what? All scripture is given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It is good for instruction. It is good for doctrine. It is good for reproof. So if we have a confirmation of why scripture is there, and scripture is there for us to be applying to our lives because mm -hmm. life comes from the scriptures. Yeah. Because Proverbs talks about it being the word, being like nourishing to our bones and our essence. Right. And we embrace this, then now God can bless us because we are going and following his word. Right. And so yes. covenant is his way of protecting us right. until he can bring us on over through time to the point where grace can step in Amen. with his son. Mm -hmm. And now grace can redeem us. Yes. And why the word redeem? Because if you put something in the pawn shop, they get a couple of dollars, they give you a ticket, and when you get ready to get it back, you, you go in there and you take the money, and the ticket lets you what? Redeem what you own. Hallelujah. So we already were God's property. Mm -hmm. We were stolen by Satan mm -hmm. from him, and Jesus comes along with the redemption ticket Hallelujah. to bring us back Hallelujah. and take us out of Satan's pawn shop. Thank you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now, some people have problems with this, but faith, salvation, is something that comes through faith, and we can't have it without believing it. Mm -hmm. We got to believe it for it to work. Mm -hmm. When we say we accept Christ into our life, and we forsake those things that are not Christ-like, the heavens don't open and drop a certificate with our name on it. <laughs> Mary Jones, you are, this is a certified that you are now saved. <laughs> Carry this around in your hip pocket and show it to people. No, you have to know that you know that you know in terms of what Hallelujah. is taking place, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now that we know that we know, this is what energizes us in terms of what we believe. Yes. This is yes. where we get yes. our strength yes. from. Yes. This is why when we go through a our transition here is not a loss because we're rejoicing because by faith we know where yes. she is. Yes. She's where we are going to go mm -hmm. because we're all here on a temporary basis. Yes. You know how I like to help us understand how temporary this is? It's like you go to France, okay? You go to France on a trip and you check in the hotel and the moment you get in your room, you start rearranging the furniture. <laughs> you go shopping and you're going to buy some pictures and put on the wall. Oh, and you're going to get some drop rugs to go in the room. And you, you look at a place like you're going to be there. <laughs> it's a temporary stop. Temporary. Right. You're not going to be there. It's not yours. <laughs> you're not on it. Thank you, you're just there for a while. Hallelujah. Doesn't that make it make more sense? What we're doing down here is like, you ever had a dream about something that was so great? or good that you would try to, you wish you could hold on to it when you woke up. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it might have been a bike when you were a child, it might have been some money later, it might have been a person when you got older. <laughs> <laughs> but you try to hold on to something and you wake up, you can't you can't bring it with you. It's the same thing when we transition. We can't take it with us. Okay. Right. And so faith is what gears us up. The covenant that God made protects us until we are ready to make the decision on our own. Uh -huh. That makes the covenant is important. And so I'm going to be going through the covenants because the word says that, what? Faith cometh by hearing and yeah. hearing by the word. And when we hear the word, then we get strengthened and we grow stronger. And as we grow stronger now, we can make our faith work. And when we know that faith is an action verb. Mm -hmm. 
We got to do something to make it work. Right. And yeah. we know this from the scriptures yeah. about God. The word tells us that God is a spirit mm -hmm. and they that worship him must worship him in spirit yeah. and in truth. Yeah. So you can't have no fake make-believe relationship with God. No. Right. You, can, you can come in here and fake it for a moment, but he knows better. Right. Okay. Yeah. And he'll, he'll catch up with you. <laughs> okay. Because he'll set up something to embarrass you. Right. <laughs> you, know? you, you have one of those moments where you slip. And, and your real speech come out, <laughs> and then you apologetic for the words that you use, but they wouldn't have come if they weren't already there. Right. Okay. Yeah. But but when you clean that thing up, you ain't got to worry about it because the word says that out of the heart comes the issues of life. Okay. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And the word says it's not what goes into a man that defiles him, but what comes out. Yes. So what comes out has to be a blessing to other people. Right. right? Yes. Amen. So this is the beginning. Now. I'm going to close with this com this comment because I'm going to be going into these this covenant thing deeper. The covenant piece works from God's standpoint because God is so consistent. Uh -huh. Hebrews 8, 3, I believe it is, and I checked the scriptures, says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Right. He doesn't change. He doesn't change. God doesn't change. God never refers to himself in the past tense or the future tense. He's always the present tense. Mm -hmm. yes. Because wherever yes. he is is present. Right. Yes. And it's not yesterday. Yes. And so if where he is is present, then as our faith grows, we know that he is with us wherever we are. Right. Jesus says, Lo, I'm with you always, even unto the ends of the earth. Right. So he didn't that wasn't just an idle statement that he made. But we have to grab this in faith. And we have to stand on no matter what's coming our way. We got to believe God is in this. Yes. He's going to res rescue me. Yes. Okay? And if he's going to rescue me, I'm going to be all right. Amen? Right. Amen. This is part one, consistency. We come back for part two. Amen? Amen. Stand to your feet.